Hello, everybody, and welcome to an extra episode of the Newgrounds podcast. Uh, for this episode, I interviewed Mick Lauer as a part of my uh, school project that I had for school, of course. Um, Zinzenix was kind enough to allow me use of the Newgrounds podcast Discord server to ask him a couple questions, and uh, the audience had some questions as well. But only him and I were recording audio, so I will ask the questions like this where the audio is missing. You'll see soon enough, but extra episode, they had Mick on before, and it came to my head, and it fit the school project. So thank you, and enjoy this extra episode with Mick Lauer, or Rice Pirate. Okay, Hit so... Me. All right. Oh God! So, for the one of the, one of the first questions that I wanted to ask was yeah uh, f- about the like equipment for voice acting yeah like a uh, obviously you'd want an XLR microphone if you're starting off and you want to like do it more professionally like a little bit at least <clears throat> so what 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 would you suggest along with like a the the, the surrounding area and foam uh, and all that. Yeah, I would say that um, most importantly is going to be your space. And I I did make a shitty, shitty video about this a long time ago, but I think the logic still stands, which is if you... I I feel like I have to sneeze, so I'm going to keep talking through this, but I might might have to sneeze while I'm doing it. Anyways, um, so... Oh, it's gone. So, yeah, I would say that in terms of the space, the space is the most important thing because you can have a great microphone, but if your space is shitty, it's going, your great microphone is going to pick up how shitty your space is. Um, And the opposite is kind of true in that you can have a a great space with not the best mic and your mics, I mean, you're just going to sound better in general. So that's always the best thing. Your space... Most people want to invest in a microphone. They get, they become like technophiles, you know. Um, I think the only people who are allowed to be technophiles are people who are either uh, obsessed with, you know, buying the newest thing, um, but they already have a space that is pretty solid in terms of soundproofing. Um, Or people who are just bored and like to collect things. Uh, that, that happens a lot. Um, but yeah, ha- make sure your space is better. Ma- make sure your space is great, regardless. It doesn't matter what your microphone is. Um, okay. In terms of a microphone, I would say that if you're spending more than $150 on a microphone for like an XLR that's like professional quality, then... Um, Either you already lined up a gig that you know is going to pay that off, um, because there's plenty of microphones that are within like the hundred, hundred and fifty mark for XLRs that will last you for so many years. The one I'm using right now, I actually probably should upgrade this one. It's an AT4040, and um, I've had it since I lived in New York, 2000. 12 and <clears throat> i will say that the preamp that i have most people they'll get an interface currently i have both i have a preamp and an interface but a lot of interfaces also have preamps so if you get the focus right which is probably the most basic bit shit you can get um it'll have a preamp built into it right um a lot of interfaces do even avid has that as well but if you can get a dedicated preamp, then that that little piece of tech, that old school tech, that's what it focuses on. And that's all that it does. Um, the Grace M101 is one of those like old pieces of tech. I'm not a big tech guy, but I do know that from talking to engineers that when they when they hear the name Grace M101, they're like, oh shit, yeah, no, I, I know what that is and uh, cool. Good for you. Yeah. And this piece cost me, I think, twice as much or three times as much as my mic. And it is uh, 
yeah, it's been super loyal. It's been great. It's uh, it's a sturdy piece of hardware. Um, and as far as the uh, interface that I have, I went from the Avid. It, it was a, what was it? Something mini. Um, I had that for a little while. And now it is the Apollo Twin Duo X. Or you can rearrange all those four terms together to create what it actually is. Apollo X Twin Duo, whatever the fuck it is. Um, but yeah, so then it plugs into that. So you create a chain, essentially. Um, a lot of people who have like their home studios they will have what a lot of people consider as like old school tech um, in terms of preamps and, and things that can do compression as well. Uh, nowadays, obviously, with computers, you can do it digitally, but a lot of people will argue that um, due to compression or, or other things that the old tech is always going to be better and that the sound quality is just better in general. So... My my chain is essentially an AT4040, an Audio-Technica 4040 into a Grace M101 preamp into my Apollo X-Twin Duo uh, Hunter's Rising Alpha, whatever the fuck it's called, um, and then into my computer. Oh, <laughs> sweet. That was a... Uh... Wow. I, I, did, I did not know about preamps at all. Uh, uh, yeah, no, the preamp is good. The, the The preamp basically takes whatever signal comes from, you know, your, your microphone. Um, and it's the preamp. So it, it makes sure that the sound coming in um, goes through like a basic filter. And there, there are certain things you can do with the high pass and the low pass. A lot of it ends up just being your gain in terms of how much, uh, you know, gain that you're putting into it. Um, but it's a very basic piece of technology that just makes sure that whatever signal that is going into your mic sounds better um, and that is amplified to the correct degree. Uh, and then e even with just the Grace M101, I still needed a way to connect it to my computer. So it still required an interface. Uh, if you get Pro Tools a lot of times, or if you get any of the Avid uh, hardware, they'll, they'll give you Pro Tools as well. You don't need Pro Tools. Um, but yeah, it it's just a, a conduit essentially. Yeah. Okay. I I, I just got the uh, the the focus right. That's, well, that, yeah. that's what I got at the moment. And, and it's a basic bitch piece of technology. And honestly, the newest ones aren't even that bad. So yeah, I, I'm not gonna shit on focus, right? I I know people that have been <laughs> using it in a professional manner. So yeah, no, good for you. Uh, same thing with certain mics. People poo poo on all sorts of things. The truth is, you know. If it's doing what you need it to do and an engineer can't hear the fucking difference, sure, <laughs> if anybody ever asks you, hey, list your hardware, and you list it, and they're like, ew, that's fucking gross. You know, well, okay, but here's the sound sample from my home studio, and if it works, it fucking works. The end, you know? Yeah, okay, that's... Wow, that's <laughs> that's great. That's a, That's like a huge chunk of everything that I that I did not know previously. I like to drop um, huge loads, my friend. I hope you could handle it. I I'm I I feel like you and I are one and the same in that sense. Boosh. Um, but yeah, you I know you talked about the uh like environment before. Yeah. Um like what would you what would you like want to have as like your your best environment? I know like kind of smaller spaces with <coughs> less just like walls and windows taking up a lot of space but like what, what are the down to the more specifics the very specific what, what would, would be, be the very specific would be that if you're playing music um any kind of room that you that you build for any kind of sound isolation i think you, there is a requirement that certain sound waves especially if you're not just playing it like into uh, like a mixer or something like that. if you're actually recording like the acoustic sound that it makes, you do require a room that can bounce sound around. And so it needs to have a size and it needs to have the, the correct kind of um, acoustics to allow the sound waves to breathe 
uh, kind of like a whine, you know what I mean? Like when you uncork it. Um, otherwise, the sound waves don't get to fully do their magic. Um, I'm, I'm sounding like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm just going off of the basic bitch knowledge I know. Uh, but I will right, say that when it right. comes to VO, uh, you don't need that. Not as much. You do need as clean of a sound as possible, which is why when it comes to padding a VO room, it looks a lot different than a recording studio for music. Um, a recording studio for music has like strategically placed um, audio foam to make sure it bounces in some geometric way that you know works for the recording and stuff like that. <clears throat> you also have specific mics especially for like drums and stuff like that, that are just kind of built for uh, recording that kind of um, acoustic sound. But when it comes to VO, uh, having the deadest space possible is generally the best. Um, You know, a lot of times, even if uh, the character that you're recording is talking in an echoey room or they're talking from across... Uh, a park or something that is something that the engineers or whatever yeah, sound designer they're gonna throw, throw it in and post right and like yeah like that yeah yeah yeah. which is you know you, i mean you say it like yeah they throw it in and post but i gotta say a, a lot of people sometimes they just get like a sound file and they hear it and they're like hey this sounds good i'll just plop that into my project and it's like uh hold up because <laughs> sometimes like the environment makes a really big difference. Um, are they thinking? Is it is somebody? Th- so is it like a thought, like in their head, or are they talking from like a distance? You know what I mean? And it's got a little bit more air between the person's ear and uh, the person talking. You know what I mean? Like there's a difference between how we hear things, and and sometimes when people are, it, it, this is the New Ground podcast, or at least it's on the New Ground podcast server, so I might as well mention it. But, yes. yeah, just that not all your sounds sound like they're on the same level. And I think intuitively we know all that. You know what I mean? But I think when you're working on a project, sometimes you forget that. You're just like, hey, yeah, this sounds know, like, cool. Um, know, yeah. Under under deadline and all that, you know, you kind of. That too. Oh, God, yeah. You'll totally forget some of these things. All, all the minor details um, that seem like minor details that when you go back, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, how did I miss that? Um I, I think that, yeah, like, where is this voice? You know what I mean? It makes all the fucking difference. Um, is it someone whispering in your ear? Is it someone in a fucking hallway? Is it in a cave? Is it outside? Is it while they're shouting from a helicopter? Whatever the fuck it is. Like, if they're shouting from a helicopter, I'd probably drop a lot of the bass um, and keep... Because the bass would probably be eaten up by like wind sounds and uh, propeller sounds and stuff like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, somebody could probably correct me on that. But just whatever makes sense when you're actually editing it to to listen to those voices. But it doesn't even matter. My point was is that whatever you record, uh, a lot of studios ask this too. Uh, maybe not in auditions because with auditions, people – it depends on who's auditioning you. Their creativity may not necessarily – be commensurate to what you're doing uh what i mean by that is let's say you work at an advertising agency and you're looking for a voice for your commercial and someone sends you raw audio with no compression and you listen to it and you're like wow this sounds really uh this just sounds really dry and airy (laughs) there's not a lot of like bass or i don't know this voice just isn't i don't know versus someone who understands audio and goes oh no we're going to compress the shit i mean we're if it's a radio thing or you know depending on what it is they're going to do stuff to it so yeah with auditions sometimes i i actually still ask this question to my friends when they audition for commercials specifically commercials because if it's a show a lot of times you send them as raw as you can um, they want to hear the raw, raw audio because they're going to do shit with it. And they already know what raw audio sounds like. But some of those commercial agencies, the agencies, when they are also doubling as a casting person and they hear voices, they're, I- I'm just going to be honest, they're fucking stupid when it comes to this. Like, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Like, they're just used to hearing audio in a certain way it's like if you were to show if you were a website designer 
and you were to show the prelim of a site, the bare bones of a site, like, hey, this is going to be the homepage, this is going to be that, this is going to be that, and you're just really hoping that the client you have isn't a, like, a complete fucking noob to, like, any kind of design stuff, because they're going to look at it and go, wait a minute, that's not the text that I would have put on the homepage. And you're like, yes, it's lorem ipsum, you fuck. It's literally a placeholder, dude. I'm just trying to show you what where things may go, okay, dude? It sounds obvious to some of us, but it's not. <laughs> it's really not. And the same thing goes for voices in a project. They'll hear something and they're like, yeah, this just doesn't have like the depth that I really would have liked. And that's because that would happen with compression and whatever else that they would do with your recording. So auditions can be tricky, but for the most part, anytime you record, your raw, raw audio is going to be important. And to create good raw audio, you're going to need the best space, which is the deadest space. If that makes any sense yeah so like small rooms no windows just <clears throat> yeah i mean hard closed. hard services in general uh, a door even your ceiling like for my studio if uh if i owned this apartment walk-in closet i would uh i'd probably have some shit stapled to the ceiling um but i don't so i don't yeah. uh, as far so, as the door the door next to me I actually ended up getting standalone panels, uh, which I then put against the door. So, yeah, it's just hard surfaces that can bounce sound um, are the things that you you want to watch out for. All right. So um, th th this may be. I don't know, kind of, kind of stupid. I'm, a, I'm a little bit out of, out of depth. There's on no, the more... there's no stupid, especially if you don't know about okay. it. It's just a question. Yeah. So, like putting like a blanket over your head and microphone and like your computer monitor and just having yeah. that around you with that. Yeah. Of that, course. So that's, that's, that's like a good idea to have whenever you're recording something for somebody. If to you do that if, now to have it, if your space is not as good as it could be. Yeah. A hundred percent. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm you, I you don't want some it. like thin ass sheet. I mean, you will want, I mean, a thin ass sheet will help too, technically, but yeah, I mean, the heavier the blanket, the better. Ha have you ever done any theater stuff in your life? I, I used to, I used to do theater a lot when I was younger. But, I did too. Uh, and yeah. you remember those curtains? I, I think so. The, so I mean, yeah, there were curtains, but... there were curtains even between yeah. curtains, but all of those curtains ate up sound. And if you wrapped yourself, I remember this. You know, sometimes you could literally wrap yourself in a theater curtain and talk into it, and it's dead. It's dead as fuck. Those curtains eat up fucking sound. The same thing goes for, you know, if you put a blanket over your head or if you're in a room full of clothes or whatever the case may be. You just need shit to eat up sound, essentially. Um, and, you know, the, the best counter example would be, like, if you're in a bathroom where everything's, like, a flat surface and... And everything echoes and, and shit like that. So, yeah, no, it, it makes perfect. You know, another thing that a lot of people do <clears throat> is uh, some people, when they're traveling, they'll bring, like, a travel mic. And when they audition, like, let's say you're on vacation and then your agent hits you up and they're like, hey, we have this audition for this gig. Um, a lot of people will go into a car and uh, record in the car. I mean, obviously you need a decent mic to pick up whatever the fuck you're saying, but a car eats up a lot of sound too. And you would know this if you've ever been so frustrated, you went into your car to just scream, uh, which I've done a lot of in my lifetime because I'm old. But yeah. yeah, you go into a car and you just scream. You scream all the rage and anger and frustration of your life. And uh, your car soaks it up like a like an emotional sponge, and it is uh, a car is a great place to do it just because it's a small space, and for some reason cars just have really good uh, acoustic kind of um, sponge spongeness. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, like yeah. There's the, not a lot of echo in a car. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it just yeah. Okay, so. 
Um, so, mo- moving on from equipment and area and all that, um, on to, like, a, like for finding work as a, as a voice actor. I mean, I know Newgrounds and the portal and the forums can help, but uh, outside of Newgrounds, how have you found work, or did you go from Newgrounds, get enough notoriety, and then people reached out to you like that. So how, how, how did that work? That's a very good question. Um, so it's both, honestly. Um, when I started voicing on Newgrounds, I was also taking classes at a place called Edge Studio. It doesn't really matter uh, what studio it was called. Sorry, I'm burping. Um, it doesn't really matter what studio that I went to. The idea was that I was still reaching out beyond Newgrounds at the time. Um, I will say that... I don't know. I think it's like 50-50. I think the opportunities I got due to uh, pursuing opportunities outside of Newgrounds and pursuing opportunities within Newgrounds... Um, I think both of them have equated to, uh, probably, probably uh, pretty damn close to the same amount of opportunities. I don't know. And I'll be perfectly honest and I'm not trying to shoot on new grounds. I know we got gold this year, but I'm, I'm trying to shoot on new grounds, but I don't know what the return is now in terms of Newgrounds was like the only place for a lot of people for a while, especially up and coming voice actors before even YouTube was a thing. So Newgrounds and their forums was like a hub for, you know, if you if you go back through the Newgrounds uh, voice actors that were there initially, a lot of them are all fucking professionals now, like a like a, a stupid amount of them are all working professionals now. Um, I don't know what it's like now with all of the other things that are out there. I will say it can't hurt um, in terms of the people that you connect with, uh, the other creative individuals. You never know who's going to fucking, you know, do, you know, make their opus and and you get to be a part of it. Um, I know when I was on Newgrounds, I didn't really care about that. I just, I mean, I was doing commercially shit with the studio and then Newgrounds was my way of being able to, to experiment with characters and just, you know, some of these projects, you know, they got a one out of five or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> but it didn't matter. It, it, none of it mattered. It, it was just an opportunity. You know what I mean? Like you just you just put yourself out there and every single opportunity, whether it got a daily or got blammed, it doesn't matter. Like you, you still put. It's your your best into it. You know what I mean. It's still an opportunity to try. Um, uh, yeah. So I I would say that I would never discount that. I I would say that Newgrounds, in my opinion, regardless if it's still as relevant in certain ways um, as it was back in the day when it was you know back when Newgrounds was one of the few places that did certain things. Um, I would never discount it because you never know where opportunities are. And I will say that the one thing I've noticed with Newgrounds is that there's definitely been a lot of people with like their thesis projects and um, other things like that, which wasn't around when I was there. Um, I mean, yes, there were some, but it seems to be a little bit more common to have stuff like that, Um, which means that you're probably... If, if, if they are asking for people, you're probably dealing with people that are a lot more serious about shit. Um, and so I don't know. I, I can't, I can't put a, uh, I can't put a, this is more valuable or less valuable on it. All I can say is that all of it's valuable. Just and put, put yourself out there. Really you, yeah. To, no, a hundred percent, a thousand percent. Um, I think the collabs are a great way. I think. Um, yeah, no, I, I think if, especially if you're starting out, who the fuck are you to even judge, right? Like if you're just starting (laughs) out, who are you to be like, is this a thesis for Cal arts or is this just some flash project? Because I'll tell you this, that person who put their fucking thesis from Cal arts. Yes, they may do very, very well. And I hope they do. Uh, they clearly put in a lot of time with their education, but 
there's going to be plenty of people who have no education in it, who just have a whole lot more heart and a whole lot more fuck you energy and or uh, I can do this myself energy. I'm not saying that that's the best energy. I'm just saying that that energy exists. And those it's people, some of them do very well. And for anyone to discount them at the start is a mistake. And that is something that I'm really happy about Newgrounds is that uh, when I first started, it was a whole lot of people that probably didn't get a lot of attention, who probably didn't get a lot of support. And so many of these people, just because, you know, you're part of the community and, and you want to help out and you want to learn, you want to you want to contribute. And a lot of these people proved so many stereotypes wrong in terms of what you can accomplish based on where you're coming from. So at the very least, I, I know I haven't been like, like, you know, poster boy for new crowns in this conversation, but I will <laughs> say that that is definitely something I can always attribute to new grounds and something that I would never not attribute to new grounds. It, it is a quality that um, is so fucking rare because when it comes to YouTube, it's always about clout. It's always about views. It's always about this. It's always about that. Money, money in the algorithm. Yeah. On YouTube. And, and Newgrounds was never that. It was never that. In fact, people would make fun of people who chase that shit. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that what you're going to get is genuine creators trying to fucking make shit, which I think lends itself really well to people who are trying to learn shit especially voice acting. So that's what I'll say. All right. Uh, it's, I, I feel, I feel so bad. Like just making you talk this whole time. No, not at uh, all. I'm high. So it's all good. Oh, oh, sweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm like outside of new grounds besides, well, how, how do you, how do you transition from new grounds? Like getting everything you can, like, you know, talking with people, making connections like that. How do you go outside and, like, do you, do you just audition to as many companies as you can, like, for commercials and all that, like, for, for like, outside, you know, flash projects or theses or yeah, whatever I mean, it is that you're doing? Yeah, how, how do you I, go outside of that? So the, the very simple answer is make a demo. Uh, your demo can include the stuff that you've done on Newgrounds if it was mixed well enough uh, hopefully it is um and yeah that's that's the simplest answer i can give you is to share your demo um the site like the the byproduct of doing stuff on new grounds is potentially and for me especially when i was there was hooking up with people who were hiring people uh a lot of the gigs some of Yes. I, I, you know what? I would say some of the more consistent gigs that I have are people that lurked new grounds and then they already had an established business or they, you know, wh whatever the case may be, um, they ended up reaching out because of that. So, yeah, uh, I, I would just say to have a demo, make a demo, because the thing about a demo, it's like. It's like a headshot if you didn't age to a degree, unless your voice changes a lot. If you're making a demo at age 12, yeah, it's going to sound <laughs> different at age 16. But if you're making a demo at age 18, that demo is probably going to last you well into your 20s, if not later. Uh, your voice isn't going to change a whole lot unless you're, like, you know, a chain smoker or an alcoholic like I was. But I think... In general, um, that's the thing that people are going to look for. Every audition that people do, they're either going to ask for the lines or if they're doing a blind audition, a lot of times before they even listen to whatever you're going to send uh, or even consider you, they're going to want to hear a demo. Um, and when it comes to demos, they usually do cost a pretty penny. But if there's people on Newgrounds or other places where you have an audiophile, someone who loves sound waves and making sure they sound right or the balance is right, 
Um, because a lot of demos include not only the voice, but like background sounds like music. Like if you're going to be a soldier and you're screaming like, let's go into the fight or whatever that you're going to have like, you know, like people in the background, like, ching chong, ching, rah, 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 you know, like fights and shit like that. Um, or whatever the case may be, somebody who understands sound so that your demo focuses on your voice. You are the star. You're not being drowned out or... You know, it's not like you humming in the background of a chorus in high school. You know what I mean? Like, because you don't remember the words. <laughs> it's it's you are the star of it. It just happens that the other sounds are there to bolster whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, um, it's, and it's hopefully you can good. find, you know, I mean, hey, if you're an animator, I would like to believe that you care about sound because or a solo animator because you're not only animating but you're creating your own thing so yeah sound ends up being a big part of it so i would say you'd probably end up crossing paths with people that also do that kind of stuff there too but once you have that demo you can pass that thing off for you know you can put it on a website you can put it on voices one two three you can give it to an agent you can give it to anybody asking for demos which is what some people do when they do auditions they don't even send out a script they're just like hey send me your demo i just want to hear what you can do um and to make sure that your demo covers what it is that you comfortably can do all right so that's that's great i'm i'm really glad you brought up uh demo reels because uh i was gonna ask like what kind of material you should put on it and I, i know a lot of people use tomar's demo reel as a kind of like a do they like baseline well i don't know my uh uh no i mean i i i'm not shitting on that i i wasn't like do they no i (laughs) i just didn't know that that was a thing um i would say that your demo reel shouldn't be any longer than a minute and a half long uh no segment that you do with a voice should be any longer than like maybe 12 seconds um and uh that's 12 seconds of talking not like Oh, footsteps in an ominous hallway or uh, electricity in a mad scientist's lab. Uh, You know, that that soundscape is cool, but the moment that that becomes like the star, it needs to stop because they don't care. They just want to hear your voice. Um, Be really honest about whether or not your nerdy guy... Oh, I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not that all nerds sound like this. Yeah, but doesn't sound too much like your mad scientist. I sound like the nerd, but I'm just more, I'm more active. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, the mad scientist cannot sound like the nerd. You know what I mean? Like, they, all yeah. your, everything you do, if you're going to put it on the fucking demo, it needs to sound fucking different. Otherwise, it's just a waste of fucking space. And that goes for, uh, accents as well so if my natural voice is like this and I oh yeah oh I'm talking but then all of a sudden I have like a slight you know the fucking D- pseudo European like... accent but this is basically the same voice but it's just you know the, the, you know not even really a different accent who fucking cares no what is it ca- cadence it, cadence right. change or something like that I'm just saying yeah. that if you're gonna do the accent make it a different voice because at the very, you want to get as much bang for your buck. They're only going to, the truth is they're probably only going to listen to like 10 seconds of this shit. <laughs> so like most of the time they're just blazing through this. They already have something in mind anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that if you're going to add an accent uh, or whatever, the other thing is sometimes people will do this uh, thing in demos where they think emotions are different. So it's like, Oh yes, this is my character. I'm I'm a voice actor and this is how I talk. But this is me sad. And this is how I talk in this character. No, it's the same fucking character. It's just one is sad. You know what I mean? And so your accent is not a different character. Your emotion is not a different character. What you need to do is combine them. You know what I mean? Like find a way to double up, triple up on this shit. So in the shortest amount of time, they can hear as much of what you can do. And that also goes for how you place your voices. So if I have like a really, yeah, you know, like he's kind of like a, 
you know, whatever the fuck this is, I don't know, fucking play Yu-Gi-Oh! or Duel Link fucking, d- fucking spinny sword <laughs> spinners, uh, whatever. And then, I've also got, like, a lower voice that I can do. Yeah, you know? You want to make sure that you can try to at least space them out where it, it, it sounds different, I think. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Just so at the very least, within a couple seconds, they get the idea that there's a range. Because if I go from all, like, ha, 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 this voice to maybe something like this voice to maybe something like this voice until finally I'm something like this voice. You know, whatever the case may be, that's like a that's like a scale, right? Like you can you can scale that shit. But they can your ears just kind of like get blended in over like 12 seconds of each of those voices. So give them this, then give them that, then give them the something else. I'll go, I don't know, some fucking You know what I mean? Like just try to change it up so they don't feel like it's predictable and that every voice is really just an octave lower or you know whatever from the one before that would be my opinion i've never had a casting director tell me (laughs) otherwise i am not an expert in any of this shit except for the fact that i work in it but even that does not make me an expert in the casting department so that i just want to make that really clear well that's it's far better way than I could have ever really put it, but you know, just like spice, variety, all the, all that, just stick that in there. And the truth, yeah, I mean, like if you've got a whole lot of different shit, then try to mix it up in a way that makes it, it, it you're not fooling anybody. I mean, it's not like you're tricking anybody into thinking that you are more diverse than you are. However, if you do kind of do like a, a scaled thing, like I just showed you, where it's like this voice and then it's kind of different into this voice and then kind of different into this voice and then kind of different in that one, what you're actually doing is tricking them into thinking that it's all kind of similar versus just kind of highlighting how it's not by separating them, if that makes sense. All right, yeah. That's... Thank you. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is kind of... I don't know, it would kind of fold into the last question, but as as an animator yourself, what would you look for in, in a voice actor who approached you? What, what, are, what are the main qualities that you look for in a voice actor? That is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say from my personal experience, that is a question I don't think I can answer very fairly. Um, because... Uh, I, I, you know what? At the end of the day, I think the number one thing is, does it sound like someone's just emulating something or are they reading the lines? Does that make any sense? Yeah. Like they're, um, they're actually like acting it out instead of, you know, yeah, reading a because script. even, even if the performance isn't exactly what I'm looking for, I would say that the idea of somebody who can say a line in a way that sounds like they're owning it means more to me. Um, yeah, but like you never know. I mean, to be fair, you know, that's the thing about casting, man. Um, it's also the thing about auditioning. You never know what people want. And <laughs> the people who are casting, uh, they don't always know what you can give. Uh, You know, they're going to go based off of whatever audition you have and they're going to think, you know, if they hear something they like, they're going to roll with that. But if there is a really big range of stuff that has to happen, it doesn't guarantee that the voice actor is prepared to do all those things. I think it is a better place to be when you hear someone uh, genuinely trying to perform those lines and not emulating what they think those lines should be. But I'm going to be perfectly honest, man. When it comes to dubbing and it comes to, like, the anime industry, you know what? Fuck that. When it comes to the commercial industry, when it comes to fucking any industry, they will tell you that they want something that is not... Uh, I don't want to say cookie cutter, but not... They'll tell you they want something original. They don't want something that, you know, sounds like what one would expect. 
um, they're lying. <laughs> they're they're lying. Uh, people who work at advertising agencies, they want to think. And, and I, you know, fuck. I if this gets public, I hope they fucking hear me. Um, they want to think that they uh, are above the norm, the normie shit. They want to think that when they send out a casting call and they say, we want something original, we want something different, we want something that doesn't sound like everything else, they'll say that. They'll straight up say that. But the truth is, they're lying. They do. And they will. That's what they will hire. Um, they're... The, their idea of what is not, uh, you know, the most commercially accessible um, really ends up being the other side of what really is commercially accessible. <laughs> um, it, it, it doesn't sound like radio, maybe, uh, but the truth is that that is what they end up wanting. Um, when they say that about anime, they don't want it to sound like, no, they, they want it to sound like an anime guy. When they say that about morning cartoons, oh, you know, this is a real character. This is a character with a real, no, they, they want it to sound like a fucking Saturday morning cartoon character. That, they, I don't know why they feel the need to do that except to just feel better about themselves and like they're doing something different or maybe they need to appease their boss or I don't know what the fuck it is. But the truth is they're all playing by the same fucking rules as all other fucking me. They're not pushing any fucking envelopes. They're not. Either they have a celebrity, so whatever they sound like is right because it's a celebrity, um, or they just feel better because they wrote in a post that they didn't want it to sound like, uh, you know, the average guy or the average commercial or something. But it, it always is. Okay. That's... That's, that's here's really here's a good important. example. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the name of the the game out loud because that that would be against NDA. Uh, but there was a game very specifically that said, "Oh, oh, I, this I, is." I, I think I think I know this game that you are talking of. <laughs> uh, I'd be surprised. There's a lot of them. I, I get this all the time. So I'm I'm not gonna say you don't, and I'm not gonna say you do. But I will say that they very specifically said that they were not looking for Saturday morning cartoon voices. And this particular character was a bit of a, I don't know, he, he was a bit of a cartoon, just in of himself. He's always been one. Um, and then I finally saw the trailer for the game and the character that played it. And it was the most quintessential Saturday morning cartoon version <laughs> Of this, it was like, it was almost like a parody of a Saturday morning cartoon <laughs> character. And when I saw the trailer, I literally just blinked like 40 times. I, and look, I didn't take it personally because I already understand. That's just kind of how it works. But I didn't think they'd go that far because it was like, whoa, really? Okay, cool. But it was just a reinforcement and a reminder that, in an audition, go with your gut. Because even if you follow their instructions to a T, there's a very good chance that is not even close to what they want because they don't fucking know what they actually want. And I'm not, I'm not shitting on them because who the fuck is even dealing with this? If it's a casting director, okay. Maybe there's a little more... There's more to that, for sure. If it is a casting director. If it's just like a fucking person who works at an ad agency. And I'm not saying that they don't have casting people at ad agencies. But they definitely have people that are just like, I got stuck with this project and I got to cast this thing. And they're just going to go with, sounds, with what sounds familiar to them. So I say, just to be safe, fuck all the shit. I mean, if they say an accent, obviously, yes, do the accent, even though that's not always true either. But <laughs> I will say, just go with your gut. If you understand the project that they're doing, commercial, game, uh, you know, whatever the fuck it is, do what you think is going to work because you're going to be able to commit to that better anyways. You're going to be able to invest in that more personally 
anyways, rather than trying to origami yourself into a position that you're not comfortable with. Just give them what you got from an honest place. And, you know, if you only book one in a hundred auditions, let me tell you, not the worst ratio. All right. Yeah, that's that's a that's some great uh, like real world information about like, you know, here on the Newgrounds podcast, we got some re- real shit. You know, trying to get real here, dude. Real here. Yeah. Real. Real, um, real grounds. Yeah. So I, I think that's like I, I think I've I've one more question. Yeah. But I, I think you've you've touched everything perfectly and that's exactly what I needed. So thank you. It makes me feel even worse now that I've uh, kinda cornered you into this you didn't corner situation. Me. You didn't corner me. <laughs> uh but uh if you could go back as a as a voice actor and give yourself one piece of information when you first started, what what would you tell your younger self? As a voice actor for information. Um, fuck. Uh, one piece of information. See, here's the thing, is that I didn't start until I was in my 30s. So I feel like if I started earlier, I'd probably have a lot more to tell me. As well. That doesn't mean there isn't things that I... You know what? Hold on. I'll answer the question. Um... I mean, you, you don't have to. You can you no, can do no, it in no. the most roundabout there, way as possible. Hey, and I'd, I'd, I don't want to. I don't want to be roundabout. I want to get right to it. But I haven't really thought about it, so I, I just need to, a second to actually kind of pinpoint a thing. There's there's always a thing. It doesn't matter what you do in life. There's always something that you you know could improve upon or or all these kinds of things. Um, uh, I would say if I could go back. And in regards to voice acting specifically, um, I think, you know what I think I would have done? I think I would have, I think I would have tried to appreciate what I think my strengths are and 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 what's weird about me that the reason why I'm hesitating when I say that is because I I don't even you know I, I don't even know if I can put my finger on the pulse of what those things are but there's obviously some things I, I you know if I was aware of those things um, that I feel like are my strengths that I would have, tried to hone them a little more and I think that's something that I've been trying to do lately kind of um the reason why I say that is there's always going to be things that you can improve upon whether it's learning new accents uh just all, all, all sorts of things and I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to learn outside of your comfort zone um, that, that's a very important thing for any job and anything that you do. Um, but I also think understanding or at least appreciating or being able to pinpoint, which I don't even know if I've been able to do, uh, your strengths in any particular field is an important thing because while you can improve on all these external things that aren't necessarily innate. I think that what makes you you and what makes what you provide so unique are the things that you do. Now, there are plenty of people that are successful who just emulate other people. There are plenty of people who just have a, a voice, I guess, that uh, uh, others like. But if there's something that you feel like is a strength... Or at the very least is something that you feel very comfortable in. I think it's good to hone in at least on what that is. Not to focus only on that. Not to ignore growth or anything like that. But figure out what that thing is. Because that uniqueness that um, 
sometimes, not always, because like I said, sometimes people hire based on the most basic bitch fucking commonalities. But if there is a unique quality that you have, um, to be able to acknowledge what that is and know that when you audition, that that is what you're bringing to the table. Um, and to do it with confidence and comfortability, because I think more of you will shine in that audition, the more comfortable you are. Uh, and whether or not that gets you the gig, eh, who knows? But at the very least, A, they're going to hear somebody being comfortable with themselves. B, if you get hired, hey, you're getting hired for something you're comfortable with. I mean, not that you should always be hired for things you're comfortable with. I mean, it, it's okay to to be challenged, but um, I think to also be okay with who you are, you know, to be okay with what you bring to the table, even if it's like a lisp, even if it's like a whatever the fuck it is, you know what I mean? Um, just, yeah, I think, uh, I think honesty goes a long way. Um, not always with, uh, the commercial world and, and not always in, in the industry in general, but at least acknowledging it allows you to, uh, not be ashamed of it and to be able to experiment with it and to be able to whip it out when you feel like it's appropriate, you know? Um, and I still don't know what that is for myself, honestly. I, I still feel like I emulate other people or I emulate what I think others need. And again, like I said, I've been trying to just be more honest and just be me, more me um, when it comes to gigs. And I don't know how it's going to pan out. <laughs> I don't know if that's good business advice, honestly. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I think if you do that, along with trying to improve in, in all the other ways, it's, it's just an additional tool in your tool belt. And that tool is just you, which I think is a good tool not to forget. That's, that's quite poetic. <laughs> very, very beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like, you know, I, I, love I ramble, like but you know, Hey, I don't know. Hopefully there's it's good rambling. It's useful. very good rambling. I must say, you know, just a sitting your younger self down, slapping them in the face, like, "Hey, you know what? Be yourself when you voice act. That's yeah, that's all you fucking need." Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely, again, like what I love about characters is that I don't necessarily have to be completely myself. Though I'd argue that every character you play is partially, it's a part of yourself. I mean, that's where. That's where the enjoyment of either being the bad guy or the good guy or whatever the fuck it is. Like, there's a part of you that is that character, and, and that's what you should be honing in on because that's where, you you know, you get to explore that side of yourself. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, there's plenty of gigs I've done where it was like, I'm talking about pizza. Do I give a fuck about <laughs> this gig? I mean, at the very least, what I care about is that you know, A, the client's happy, and B, that whatever message is being shared is being, you know, communicated. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you're not always going to have these gigs where you're just you talking, and I'm not saying that that is what all gigs should be. Um, but even if you are another character, to to just be mindful that you're there too, and to also, you know invest invest yourself in that way uh because it will make it a lot more i think it'll make it a lot more genuine people you know we've watched so many animes we've watched so many movies we've heard so many commercials when you hear a radio commercial you can hear from a mile away that whoever the fuck is talking doesn't give a fuck about whatever they're promoting <laughs> You can hear it. You can you can. It, We're it, inundated right. with media. We are. And so the idea that you know <laughs> to try to be genuine or or at least to care about the thing you're saying like it's not a far off shot, you know? Like when you do hear a character in a thing where you're just like, "Wait a minute. I I'm listening." You know what I mean? Like I'm I'm caring about this shit. Um I think that can only exist if the person either understands, A, 
uh, how to communicate a message to an audience or B, they just naturally connect to that message. And so it, it comes out naturally. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you this long. I, d I didn't think it would take this long. It's only been, um, what, I don't even know how fucking long, what, an hour? It's been, it's been a whole hour. I think it's been a whole hour. About, about 50 minutes, 50, 55 minutes. Well, um, it's all good to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't exactly tend to keep you this long, but I I know I know Zen had a couple more questions for you that were, All right. I mean, less less formal. Hit uh, me up. But yeah, I mean, Zen, if if you wanna if you wanna take the stage and ask away the uh, the animator questions, the things that people are actually interested in. Oh, uh, stop. <laughs> This is the first section of Missing Audio, where uh, one of Zinn's questions that he didn't ask during the podcast is what is the best piece of advice that he had been given towards his career? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, well, uh, Tomar specifically told me to move to L.A., um... That was really about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think to a degree, look, I have never claimed and I will never claim that I'm some great voice actor. I've gotten opportunities and I've tried my best to do the best I can with those opportunities. And that, I think, ends up being everybody's fucking journey. Um, they can try to posture that they think they're the best. And I don't know a lot of people who do, so... Uh, but for anyone who does, they're lying, uh, because <laughs> there's so many fucking people that could do their fucking job. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that there's no talent in voice acting or no ability in that or, you know, whatever, but I'm also not saying that every voice actor is some fucking unicorn that exists every thousand, you know, centuries on a full blood red moon or whatever. Um, I just think that, I, I just think that, you know you if you're passionate about it at the end of the day it's an endurance game that's really what it is um are you willing to do the auditions are you willing to audition a hundred times before somebody says sure we'll hire you um because that is the industry honestly uh for a lot of people not everybody you know for some of my friends they're they're literally voicing every day several times a day and I want to congratulate them. They're very talented people. I'm very happy for them. Not going to lie, though. I couldn't live that fucking life. I just couldn't. <laughs> I, I, I want to work on Blood Sun Vendetta. You know, like, that's what I want to fucking work on. Um, that said, for the uh, gigs that do happen, I give it everything I got, you know, and, and I love them as much as I can. And even if it's just you know, a bunch of side characters or whatever, I'm going to give it everything I got. You, you know, I think the danger is that you ever get lazy. The danger is that you ever do shit by rote. You think that, ah, I've done this a hundred times. Who cares? You know, the moment you do that, what the fuck are you doing? Like, d no, stop, do, do something else. Um, I think you, you need to be able to always find a way to be passionate about the things that you're doing, even things that you don't think you're going to be passionate about. Find the passion in it. Otherwise, you're wasting your goddamn time. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the only advice I really got was to move to L.A. And uh, I took Tomar's advice. And it was the best advice I got, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean... I am curious. I am curious now, with all the remote shit going on, because that was the biggest reason. Was if you want to work in LA, you got to be in LA. But since the COVID stuff, and it's not like a fad. I mean, fuck, we've been like this since last March, right? So it's been like a year, a whole a year. ass year, yeah, a whole ass. So year. for like a whole ass year the entire industry shifted 
to home recording. Now, I'm not going to name uh, the project, but I will say that there was an audition for a project that literally said that they would, if you booked the gig, send you an entire home recording studio for the gig. Now, that is very unusual because usually your home studio is going to be enough. However, they said it was because they want to make sure sound quality was consistent, which totally get. Totally, totally understandable. I don't think that's out of the question. Um, but the fact that they took it that seriously, that they were not like, because some studios are like, hey, we know people don't want to go in during the pandemic, but do you think you could come in? Like, we'll sanitize you and stuff. It'll be fine. Um, but other studios are literally like, look, we get the health issue. Let us alpha the fuck out of this situation and say, we will send you a home studio so you can record. And it's just like, what? But I, I think that I get it that after the pandemic, it'll probably not be like this. However, it is impossible to ignore the impact that uh, it has made in terms of home recording. Because home recording was for the longest time kind of like a thing people did when you kind of, you know, like if there's a celebrity on the other side of the country or, you know, whatever the case was, you know. Um, but now it's definitely become a hell of a lot more normalized, not just in voice acting, obviously, in tech and in all sorts of businesses. Um, but I am curious if you do need to be in L.A. anymore, that maybe things are a little different. I, I, I don't know. I do think that convenience over time, people forget, you know. Uh, so I do think in the next year or two, it'll be back to, hey, you got to be in L.A. You got to come into the studio. Otherwise, you know, they're just going to hire somebody else. Uh, I do think that. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe it won't be. Because it sure as hell ain't now. Here is the second piece where there is missing audio, and this is where Corey asked uh, Mick what working with Dan Green was like. And uh, so here's his elaboration about all that. <laughs> oh, oh, it's so good. I mean, here's the thing. I don't know if you guys know this about Dan Green, but he's got some tragic fucking shit. Um... That happened to him. And he is literally the nicest one of... I mean, I'm 40 years old. Of all the human beings I fucking met, Dan is one of the nicest human beings. One of the most wholesome, nicest, realest dudes I've ever met. And I'm not just saying that because of what he's gone through. Um, he just is. He just is. Uh, maybe there's some dark secrets I don't fucking know about. Maybe he's got some skeletons I don't fucking know about. I don't know. But from the time that I spent with them, which is, you know, I think over the, the years I was in New York, hundreds of hours, uh, you know, um, the dude is just such a good guy. Uh, he, he, you know, even if he's dealing with someone where, he thinks it's a challenge, like to get a performance out of him. He's gonna do what he can. Um, he doesn't hold back. He is polite, but he doesn't hold back. He's just a really good guy. So I would say uh, the the short answer to your question is how was it? I could not be luckier to have gone into voice acting and learned voice acting with someone like Dan Green around because, yeah, there were other people uh, that I studied or that I trained with at edge studio. I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on any of them at all. They, they all had their expertise and their knowledge and their whatever. Uh, but Dan was just somebody that I think I resonated a little bit more with. And, um, you know, it was funny cause he seemed a little bit like not ashamed, but like didn't want to talk about like the anime stuff he's done at the time. And it's funny because he was such a big figure in it. And I didn't know, uh, until later, but I think uh, obviously now the uh, the shadow that is cast by 
working on um, anime stuff is is pretty much gone to a degree. In the industry, if you do too much anime stuff and you are non-union, or at the very least you're not doing any union stuff, some agencies will view you as the anime person. They will view you as, oh, that's what they do. You know, that that's their cap, you know, whatever. Which is a bummer, and uh, you don't ever want that to be your reputation. But it, it can be a reputation. And I think he was probably trying to avoid that for a while. Um, but as a performer, as a human, as a teacher, uh, amazing dude. Um, I had quit acting for a while. Like I went to college for acting, and I just hadn't done any acting at all for uh, several years. And it wasn't until I started getting into voiceover. I started with the commercial narration stuff, and then I was like, yeah, but you know where my heart is in character stuff? And that's why I was doing a lot of new ground stuff. And then uh, they were like, okay, well, if you're going to do character stuff, then Dan's your guy. And I was like, okay. And he was. He a thousand percent was. Um, yeah, no, uh, huge motivation um, and just endlessly supportive. Yeah. It's weird. I have a. <laughs> I, ha- I have I have one little thing that I w- okay. that I was curious about, and I yep. think you talked about it before. Sure. But uh, were you involved with the the fan game Hunt Down the Freeman? You fucking you. Fucking... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Are you actually asking? Are you actually asking, or was that a joke? No, I knew you were involved with it, but I <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I then wanted, you knew. I wanted to know. I wanted to know, like, what that was like, like as a as an entire situation, just con- condensed into like a couple of sentences. Um, it was it was like working on a Newgrounds project for an animator who's only animated a few shorts who then wanted to animate a whole ass series who thought that whatever they were going to make was going to fucking break the internet like Kim Kardashian's ass and that they were going to be able to pay everybody and do all these things and what they ended up creating was fucking blammed at the portal. That's basically (laughs) what that experience was. And that it took uh, over a year at least on on uh, my end but it took several years on his end um my summary really is that uh i appreciate people who are ambitious and i think it's great to dream big um and i'm not even afraid to jump on board to something that i you know that that if they're inexperienced but they seem passionate about like I'm happy to contribute in a way. Um, But I will say in this particular scenario, it was a product that other people were meant to pay for. And uh, they were meant to pay, you know, like the rate of a game for this uh, project. And uh, yeah, it just didn't meet. It it just wasn't uh, up to snuff. It was uh, kind of an embarrassment. Um, but at the same time, you know, you live and learn. I feel bad for anyone who lost any money on the game, like paying for the game. Uh, I, I myself lost thousands of dollars in what was promised to me in terms of the year commitment that I made to it. Um, but I, you know, you move on, you know. And, uh, it's a piece of internet history, so, yeah. Uh, yeah sorry, I, I just wanted your two cents on it. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, it sucks. There was a lot of passionate people behind it. There, there were, he brought together some people who were just writing for a paycheck, and then he also brought some people together who were trying to create something special. And um, if anything, uh, the only people I feel bad for, I certainly don't feel bad for him, and I don't feel bad for myself. 
But if I feel bad for anybody, and not even the audience, because the audience, you know, they either got a refund or they fucked off. It, it doesn't matter. They got memes out of it. I feel bad for the people that were a part of the project, who invested a lot into that project, who cared about it, who believed in it, and who were ultimately let down by how it was all put together. Um, there were a lot of people who sacrificed a lot to uh, be a part of something they believed would be great. And uh, they bought into a dream. And my investment was relatively small, despite the fact that it lasted over a year. And, you know, the money didn't happen. But these guys, you know, that were a part of, like, the dev teams or, or whatever the case was, uh, they, were, they were on board for years. And um, their efforts culminated in what everyone on the Internet laughed at. And uh, it's got to fucking suck. So... I'm always going to have my heart out to those guys who really cared and wanted it to be good. This concludes the uh, the extra episode. Uh, there was a little bit more left at the end there, but uh, a lot of voices got in there, and a lot of them were unrecorded. So, unfortunately, I had to yank him out of there at the end. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And... Uh, there, there thus concludes the podcast thank you all for listening and uh yeah extra episode it was fun would be great to be back but probably not you know uh yeah thank you all for listening bye bye catch you on the flip side